Ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, back uh, here after the coffee break. I'm seeing uh, many friends and familiar faces in the audience. For those who don't know me yet, uh, I'm Ali Aslan. I'm a Berlin-based international TV presenter and journalist, and I have the great pleasure and delight uh, to be moderating this upcoming very, very crucial and timely talk with none other than a gentleman who is an extremely inf influential voice and has been an extremely inf influential voice in US foreign policy for the last three decades. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former White House National Security Advisor, Ambassador John Bolton. Good to, see you. Good to have you. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for taking the time. Uh, at a time when there's a lot, uh, a lot of things happening here uh, in the world, in the Kamka region as well. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But let's focus on the one issue that's been dominating the headlines for the better part of the last three months, which, of course, is Ukraine, a war which has recently marked a sad anniversary, the first 100 days of the war that uh, we have seen. As a very experienced international voice and expert, what has surprised you the most throughout the first three, four months of this war? Well, I think the, uh, the, 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 the most surprising thing to me was the uh, lack of effort by the United States in the first instance to try to deter the Russian aggression before it occurred. Uh, because obviously that would be the best outcome, that uh, the Kremlin concluded that the risks and the cost were so high that it didn't proceed with the invasion. Uh, and I thought that was a real failure of, uh, of leadership. Uh, You're talking about the Biden administration here. Right. Um, uh, and I think that's a, it's a failure that has uh, ramifications, not just in Ukraine, but, but uh, more broadly in Moscow and in Beijing in particular. The, the second thing that was surprising, and certainly not just to me, but, but to the Russians and US intelligence, was how poorly the Russian military performed in, in the opening days of the war. Uh, they obviously thought they would have uh, very significant success. Uh, you can question their strategy. I think there's a lot of uh, things you can say about what they did wrong, but they were surprised at the extent of the Ukrainian opposition. And I think they and we were surprised uh, at how poor uh, the, the, uh, the actions of, of their own invading forces were. You know, it's no secret that American intelligence was briefing the House and the Senate in the early days that Kyiv would fall in a few days and the country would fall in a few weeks. So uh, that obviously didn't happen and the Russians had to uh, recalibrate. Uh, I think uh, I'd say the third surprising thing was that there has been uh, significant NATO unity, but not as much as uh, President Biden and other Western leaders are saying. There's still a lot of divisions, and it's something that Putin and the other Russian leaders uh, will work to uh, uh, to our detriment if we're if we're not careful. But. Uh, th this, is, uh, this was obviously an act of unprovoked aggression, and uh, the way we handle it, the way NATO handles it, uh, will have uh, people studying it all over the world for a long time, but especially uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, and, and I think in the, in the states of the former Soviet Union who are, uh, I ha hate to say this, but you have to be straightforward about it, who I think are somewhere next in the priority list in the Kremlin. You're saying this was an unprovoked act of uh, war on the part of the Kremlin. You, of course, know Vladimir Putin very well. You've known him for two decades. You've met him several times. Uh, did his decision uh, surprise you to actually go in to actually attack Ukraine? He's, he's been toying with it verbally and rhetorically, but to actually do it, was that surprising to you? No, I, I wasn't surprised. He, uh, you know, he gave all of us advance notice uh, back in 2005. I bet everybody in this room that knows what he said when he said the breakup of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Um, that's uh, what I took that to mean was that he would aspire to reestablish Russian hegemony over that space, but, but uh, beginning in 2008 in Georgia, repeated in 2014 for the first time in Ukraine, and now this year, it's obvious that at least in, in some respects, he has more than hegemony in mind. He has uh, 
reintegration and won't be the Soviet Union, it will be the Russian Empire this time. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, he was, he was uh, motivated uh, in, the, in the present circumstance because after the uh, attack on Georgia, he did not meet with an effective Western response. After the first assault on Ukraine, he did not meet with an effective Western response. And he saw the U.S. withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan last summer, which was a catastrophic strategic mistake. And I think in part uh, his optimism at the beginning, uh, Russia's optimism at the beginning was based on recent precedent. They didn't think they would, they would see significant opposition. And you're saying the 2008 aggression against Georgia, 2014, obviously the annexation of Crimea and the recent withdrawal uh, of NATO and U.S. troops in Afghanistan, that all combined emboldened Putin to go ahead. Yeah, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of speculation in the media about what Putin's health is and what his mental stability is. I, I just say this, I do not think Putin has a screw loose. Uh, I think he's as cold-blooded a person as I've ever seen. I think he, he uh, knows what he thinks Russia's national interest is. Uh, and he does his cost-benefit analysis, and he turned out to be wrong in significant respects this time, but it's not because he was acting irrationally, uh, which ought to worry everybody here. Um, uh, he, he sa I said to me on a number of occasions after we've come to no agreement on arms control or something like that, he'd say, well, you have your logic and we have ours and we'll see who prevails. And that's, that's what he's going through in, 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 uh, in Ukraine right now. Let me just say one other thing, because I think it's important. In this country, uh, and I think in much of Europe, people talk about Putin's war in Ukraine. Uh, and they talk about his responsibility and, and uh, culpability for the war. He's obviously the top decision maker. But I think it's a mistake for, uh, for observers to, to personalize the war to that extent because there are many, many Russians, and not simply because of the Kremlin's propaganda, but many, many Russians who think the breakup of the Soviet Union was illegitimate, that pieces of the Soviet Union were ripped away from Mother Russia, and that, uh, that the, these are illegitimate failed states. I've heard, I've heard that from Putin and others directly, and they're gonna get them back. And uh, so when we talk about Putin's war, if he got hit by a bus tomorrow, and Sergei Shoigu took over, or Nikolai Patrashev, or, or any of most of the ones around him, Sergei Ivanov, they'd pursue the same policy. So this is uh, Russia's war rather than just uh, Putin's war. Uh, you've already been critical here on stage about the Biden administration's handling uh, of this crisis, saying there's a lack of deterrence. There has been a lack of deterrence, probably taking off troops on the ground prematurely was probably something that you would perceive uh, as a mistake. Uh, what, if anything, uh, would have been different under uh, President Donald Trump? To say that you've been critical of him would be an understatement. Yeah, well, <clears throat> uh, as I've said before, I think the Russians would be in Kyiv already. Uh, I think uh, uh, Putin could see that uh, Trump didn't have faith in the NATO alliance, didn't believe in it, didn't believe countries were living up to their obligations, and many, many were not living up to their obligations, still are not living up to their obligations. Um, but I think he, he believed that, that a weakened NATO would have been even uh, less uh, capable of standing up to the to the Russian aggression, and and I think uh, I think he would have proceeded shortly after the the inauguration. Uh, you know, you can never tell exactly. Putin is uh, has a rare combination of being both patient and agile, uh, which is unusual in leaders. Uh, and I think he believed he would pick his spot, and he was content to wait uh, until that point. But but we've not had effective uh, policy toward Russia from the U.S. in a long time. It's not just Biden, it's not just Trump, it certainly was Obama. And uh, over a long period of time, that builds up uh, expectations uh, in the capitals of our adversaries that uh, it's inevitable they'll seek to take advantage of them. Yeah, you're saying that uh, early on you said it was uh, to, to the surprise of many, not to you and some insiders, that, uh, of uh, the lack of Russian strength of the Russian military in this particular regard. Can Ukraine still win this war? Well, I think we have to define what, what we mean by win it, and we haven't, <laughs> we haven't done that either. I mean, I think uh, uh, 
uh, obviously it's uh, the final decision rests with Zelensky and, and the Ukrainians, but I can tell you what I think the U.S. position ought to be at this point, and it's the same position uh, that we had on February the 23rd, the day before the invasion began, and that is that Ukraine should be restored to full uh, territorial integrity and control over the borders it inherited when the Soviet Union broke up on December the 31st, 1991. That was the basis on which the Union was dissolved. Uh, nobody can say that the borders are uh, entirely sensible because they came after 70 years of communist rule, but there's no other acceptable way to achieve the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and you can like it or not, those are the borders everybody got. And the most important test was that none of those borders should be changed by force. Uh, we've heard recently uh, a very disparate group of people, the editorial board of the New York Times, Henry Kissinger, President Macron of France, some isolationist Republicans here say it's time for Ukraine to give up territory, to make concessions, to uh, save face for uh, Putin give him, give him a way out. Give him a way out, he controls 20% of Ukraine. What, 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 from his point of view, the war may have been costly, but it's being fought not on his territory, but on Ukraine's. This is not the time for any of us to be urging Ukraine to compromise, because it will just reinforce uh, the lesson that if you persist long enough, the West, the United States, Europe, uh, just get bored and tired and go on to something else. And that's entirely the wrong lesson for him to learn. Mm, that's something, of course, that President Macron, French President Macron, just reiterated that at some point the Ukraine will have to uh, negotiate with Russia. At some point, President Zelensky will have to sit down with uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, let's talk sanctions here for a second, because uh, the, the dependence uh, on, on, off of Russian oil and gas on the part of Europe in particular is well documented. Uh, are the sanctions working, or are they counterproductive even, as somebody like Jeffrey Sachs, for instance, told me in an interview recently? Yeah. Well, I don't think the sanctions have been nearly as effective as they could be, and I speak with somebody who's had a lot of experience with sanctions. Uh, we've sanctioned a lot of countries and administrations I've begin, have been in, beginning with Saddam Hussein in, in 1990. Um, the, the, the best day sanctions have is the day they're announced. Uh, they go downhill from there. If the, if the target um, uh, sees opportunities to evade the sanctions, if they can mitigate the effects, reduce the cost, they're going to do it. You have to be one step ahead of the target of the sanctions. I think the, the lesson is the broader the sanctions, uh, the stricter they are, the harder they're enforced, the more determination of the sanctioning countries, the greater the chance that they will succeed. And we're not seeing that. We're not seeing that. I mean, we, ha we have to be honest with ourselves. Uh, our, our great friends in London announced, for example, a few months ago they were ceasing all purchases of Russian oil and gas, and everybody applauded. And then you read the fine print, and it's effective December 31st. <laughs> well, OK. Um, and and you, you, can, you can see a lot of examples of this. So have the sanctions imposed significant economic cost on Russia? Yes, they have. Uh, have they been evading the sanctions to a considerable extent? Yes, they have. Take the financial institutions. I, I don't have any doubt that Russian banks and other uh, entities that are sanctioned are uh, laundering money through Chinese financial institutions, which are about as opaque as, as any in the world. Uh, Russians have found alternative buyers for oil and gas. Uh, publicly reported figures show India has more than quadrupled the amount of oil it was buying from Russia. Admittedly, uh, these transactions are at a discount, but when the World market price is $115 a barrel. You can take a significant discount. You're, you're still going to make a profit off of it. I mean, I could go on, but the point is, uh, uh, I think, uh, I think the, the performance has been weak. And, uh, you know, in many respects, uh, the Europeans did a lot of this to themselves by becoming dependent on natural gas in particular uh, from Russia. And they, they will, I hope, learn their lesson. But in the short term, they're still buying gas from Russia as it 
grinds Ukraine into the ground. Mm, and and uh, no easy and fix, uh, no easy fix, and no easy not solution. Not in the short to, term, right? Not in the short term uh, for certain. Um, th there are of course those who say Ukraine must quote unquote win this war uh, because otherwise it w might and will lead to a domino effect uh, that uh, President Putin would see a victory in Ukraine as uh, carte blanche to to move to other states. Uh, Georgia, we have many Georgians here uh, in the audience. Moldova, the Baltic states. Do you believe in that domino theory? Yeah, I, th I think, again, to go back to what Putin said in 2005, this is implementing uh, the, the effort to reverse the breakup uh, of the Soviet Union. So it's uh, uh, Ukraine's in, in the gun sites today, but I think others could be next. Uh, I do not think that there really, at this point, is much of a threat to NATO countries. I think, I think the lesson was uh, that, that without the NATO guarantee, other countries would be vulnerable. Uh, and I'm, I'm confirmed in that logic by Finland and Sweden, which after hundreds of years, in the case of Sweden, have declared neutrality, now, now want to become NATO members because they understand that neither the Soviets nor the Russians have ever crossed a NATO border, and that's where security lies. So I think part of our problem here and part of the strategy we now have to develop for all of the former constituent parts of the Soviet Union is what, what do we do in the absence of actual NATO membership to avoid what, hap what is happening in Ukraine now uh, happening elsewhere? And, uh, uh, you know, you don't, you don't get uh, many laboratory experiments in international affairs, but, but I'm sure people will remember that in, in uh, April of 2008 at the Bucharest NATO summit, George W. Bush proposed bringing Ukraine and NATO, uh, Ukraine and Georgia into NATO on a fast track. The French and Germans blocked it. Four months later, four months later, the Russians invaded Georgia. Uh, and uh, it's, it's the only surprise is they waited as long as they did before going into Ukraine. But there are many other countries, everybody in this room knows it, where Russian troops never really left after the breakup uh, of the Soviet Union. You saw this was just before Christmas time, the Russian operation in Kazakhstan uh, at, at the request of the government, but that was quick in and quick out and uh, showed they could do it. There's at least some part of the Russian military that functions efficiently, uh, and everybody else is at risk. So uh, NATO, I think, uh, I would say on our part, we made a big mistake uh, when uh, the Cold War ended, the Eastern, Central and Eastern European countries came to NATO to request membership because they wanted protection. N NATO didn't rush to expand eastward at all. We were responding to what the Eastern and Central European countries wanted. Uh, but we never thought through what, what happens when we stop admitting new members. Uh, and what we did was certainly visible in Europe, but it's visible, I think, in all of the, the, the former republics. We've created a gray zone now, not in NATO, but not part of Russia, and therefore vulnerable to, to Russian meddling. So in this gray zone in, in, in Central Europe, in the Caucasus, in Central Asia, uh, we, we've got to think now uh, about what we're going to do and uh, 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 ha how, to, how to say to the Russians and, and say to China along its periphery, uh, don't, don't, don't learn the wrong lesson from what you see in Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainian uh, NATO membership seems to be off the table now, something that even President Zelensky is admitting. Well, you know, it's, uh, 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 people say, but, you know, it's corrupt in Ukraine and it's not a stable democracy and so on and so forth. Um, uh, for, for all our friends in Eastern and Central Europe, their democracies weren't entirely stable in the 1990s, and they were not without corruption either. That, that wasn't a test. The test was, could they meet uh, the standards of, of being in NATO and, and hopefully develop their democracy, improve their uh, transparency, and, and, and uh, to a large extent they have. The real problem, and Putin and the Russians know this, is that it's always been NATO policy not to accept a new member where there are foreign troops on the soil of that country without that country's permission, because to take that kind of country into NATO, at least this has been the thinking so far, to take that country into NATO means taking in a country that's technically in a state of war with somebody, which would then put NATO into a state of war. So uh, uh, 
with the number of frozen conflicts that Russia has created over the years, the number of places where there are Russian troops, this is very difficult. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, uh, we, we've got to think of some other way of doing this. Uh, we, we've got problems right now because of uh, Turkey with Finland and Sweden. We're going to have to figure out how to get through those problems. But it's very important for all of us, as I said before, to think about uh, what the U.S. and, and NATO uh, more broadly can do in the former republics of the Soviet Union, because I think they are the next targets. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, we'll see what the European Union will say about uh, candidacy as far as um, uh, Ukraine, but also Georgia is concerned uh, in the coming days. Uh, Ukraine, of course, is not a member or part of the Kamka region. Afghanistan, though, is. And, and, and uh, we talked a little bit about Afghanistan and that the hasty NATO and U.S. withdrawal might have emboldened uh, Putin. If you're looking at Afghanistan today, and obviously you were part of the Trump administration who initiated the peace talks in Doha uh, with, uh, with the Taliban, if you're looking at the situation uh, right now, all the pledges that the Taliban made back in Doha, they seem to have backtracked now. Yeah, what a surprise. I mean... Yeah. <laughs> It was, look, it was a mistake for the Trump administration uh, to get into negotiations with the Taliban and the Taliban alone. When, when this got started, uh, uh, actually fairly early in, in my tenure in the White House, uh, it was to uh, test out uh, representations that had been made to us about certain factions of the Taliban being serious about peace negotiations and about having the capacity to speak essentially for Taliban as a whole, which, which were always dubious, but we, uh, I thought it made sense to check them out. What, what didn't make sense was to begin negotiations, continue negotiations, and conclude negotiations with a terrorist group without ever bringing in the legitimate government of Afghanistan, which which we had spent a lot of time and effort to help develop. Uh, I think the effect, uh, and, and uh, you know, no negotiations ultimately are secret very long. Once it became public that they were underway, it had to have a devastating effect on uh, the morale of the uh, Afghan National Army, the Afghan government, the Afghan people. And then the, the net result was the negotiation of an agreement that was a bad agreement given to the Afghan government effectively on a take it or leave it basis. Uh, and I think the, uh, the, uh, the Taliban understood uh, too well that what motivated Trump was he wanted American forces out. He didn't really care about a peace deal. He wanted out. And uh, something that goes, goes back years and years, I heard it many times, but, uh, but I'm sure the Taliban uh, believed it, and they, they turned out to be right. This uh, idea the Taliban would say about it, the Americans, uh, you have the watches, we have the time. And uh, they could see Trump looking at his watch about every 15 minutes, and uh, uh, they, they, they knew they had the, the leverage. What, what is surprising is that Biden came in, adopted the Trump deal, uh, implemented it, and it was, it was a catastrophic failure, yeah. and, and no surprise. The, tal the Taliban... Uh, were prepared to say almost anything uh, about conditions in Afghanistan after they took over, about what would happen during the course of the withdrawal. They didn't intend to follow much of anything. They, they knew that, that when the Americans withdrew, NATO would have to withdraw. This was going to fall into their lap, and that's exactly what happened. And you uh, voiced your objection and your skepticism at that time, I assume. Right, and uh, but it was it was uh, it was clear Trump was determined to do it, and uh, the the you know he to the point where he wanted to have the Taliban to Camp David, for goodness sakes, to sign the final deal, um, and uh, all I can say is I, I after after that it was only two weeks until I resigned because I had, as you say I'd given my opinion. It obviously wasn't having an effect. Mm. The, the, the Kamka network consists of 10 countries, of course, of Central Asia, Mongolia, the Caucasus, and Afghanistan. We have uh, many, many representatives and members of Kazakhstan here as well, obviously a country that has went through some turmoil at the beginning of this year with the uprisings, the protests, now the referendum. Uh, what, what is your take there? Um, certainly the, the country is charging in, in a new direction, it seems. Yeah. Well, I think... Uh, 
Kazakhstan, to me, was always one of the countries with a uh, substantial uh, ethnic Russian minority, and we, we worried about Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania in a comparable position where that could be an excuse for Russian military intervention. I think that remains. I think it's, uh, uh, I obviously don't know what Putin's uh, strategy is for the, for the Central Asian states, but it's, uh, uh, it's, they, they are even farther removed from NATO uh, geographically. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, the very few silver linings in the, in the cloud of, uh, of Ukraine, but one of them is uh, I don't think the Russian military is going very many other places until there's uh, some substantial uh, improvement. And so there's, there's some element of time here, would be my guess, absent another invitation from a government for the Russians themselves to come in, so that if it were cooperative as the uh, as the uh, intervention in Kazakhstan recently was, not so recently now, but that, that's a different scenario and one to worry about. But, uh, but if we've got a little time collectively uh, for, the, for the Russians to, to try and, and regroup whenever the Ukraine conflict uh, ends, I think, I think we should take advantage of that time because we may not get it again. And certainly uh, those are countries, the Kamka countries, Kazakhstan, just one example where both the Russians but also the Chinese, of course, China is very much involved trying right. to gain influence in those part of the region. Does the U.S. have its eye on the ball here? Is the U.S. sufficiently involved in that region, in your opinion? No, I, I don't think so. I think this is a, a, a strange uh, aspect of, uh, of American policy, but uh, I think I think the uh, the, the focus was on uh, pivoting to East Asia. Remember the, the that happened in the Obama administration too, as if the United States has the option to say, well, we don't care about the Middle East so much. We don't care about Europe. We don't care about Central Asia. China does care about <laughs> Central Asia. <laughs> Just look at a map. Um, and, uh, and so as, as uh, developments take place with respect to the overall Chinese threat, uh, and there have been some positive developments in this administration, the AUKUS agreement between Australia, the UK, and the US to make nuclear-powered submarines for Australia, moving forward, making progress with the Quad, Japan, India, Australia, and the United States, but there's a lot more, a lot more to be done. And, uh, uh, ignoring Central Asia and Mongolia uh, would just be uh, huge mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't, I don't see, I don't see uh, certainly adequate thinking by the administration. And uh, how do you explain this uh, lack of interest, lack of strategy in the region? Well, I'm not sure they have much of a strategy on China generally. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are bits and pieces. I think part of the problem with China and Russia is the is the uh, the, the sense that the overarching priority really is climate change and, and that somehow that's more important than geopolitical reality in much of the rest of the world. Uh, many of you may have seen uh, former Secretary of State Kerry a day or two after the Russian invasion said uh, it was really, this invasion is really, really disturbing. Think of all the carbon dioxide that's <laughs> going to be released into the atmosphere. And, and he said, I hope this doesn't impair our ability to negotiate with Vladimir Putin about climate change. I mean, what, what planet are we on if that's a priority? But um, in the case of uh, China, which uh, you know, has signed a lot of international agreements on climate change, and as far as I can see, hasn't abided by any of them, uh, that if you want to look at sources of uh, carbon dioxide emission, there, there's the place to go. And, uh, and if climate change is your highest priority, you know, other things that China does take a lower priority, that's a signal to them that they can have a free hand in the East China Sea, the South China Sea on their land borders, very, very disturbing. And uh, I think it's, it's something we, we are not, I mean, it's, it has not risen to the level of being a big debate in the U.S. yet, but I think it's, it's a concern over Taiwan certainly uh, is very high, and that, that is driving a lot of our uh, analysis here today. Considering that the U.S.-China uh, relations or tensions, if you will, will 
uh, probably mark the better part of the 21st century. I think attention at some point will have to be paid here uh, when it comes to Washington. We have approximately 15, uh, 20 minutes left. Obviously, I want to make use of uh, the great deal of expertise we have here in the audience. I want to bring you in here for some questions that you can address uh, to uh, Ambassador Bolton. Take the opportunity. We have microphones uh, in the room. So if you have a question, please indicate uh, that you would like to um, uh, ask a question. I'll, I'll bring you in here. The first one I know is always a bit, uh, is a bit tricky. So, so just uh, raise your hand if you have a question. I'll bring you in. In the meantime, uh, and I'll come to you in just a second. Can we get this gentleman a microphone? Um, the nuclear threats. Uh, obviously, Russia uh, is not a normal country to be battling with. At the end of the day, it's the country with, uh, yeah, with the highest and uh, largest stockpile of uh, nuclear warheads uh, in the country. Ha it's something that Vladimir Putin has toyed, obviously, and, and uh, uh, rhetorically any, anyway. How realistic do you foresee the chance of something like that happening? Well, Russian military doctrine contemplates the use of uh, tactical nuclear weapons in a very adverse battlefield situation. Uh, I don't see it here. I think it would be like signing a suicide note for Putin to use nuclear weapons. Um, and I don't, I don't see them being in the, in the uh, state of dire need that would give rise to it. I think he likes to threaten uh, on the nuclear side because he, he believes that uh, prompts a weaker response from, from the West, but I, I, I don't see it. I do think the question of China is much more important. Uh, you know, whether, whether you think uh, strategic arms control agreements work or not, there's no point at this, at this stage in history, there's no point in further bilateral U.S.-Russian arms control agreements on nuclear weapons. If you don't include China uh, in, in the negotiations, you're basically giving them a license to build up to whatever level they want, and then they say, okay, now we've got enough, now we'll negotiate. That's, that's not the way we should allow it to work. So I think there's a, uh, the, 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 the Russian capabilities are there uh, and, and are serious and, and should concern us, but the growing threat uh, uh, for as far as we can see, and it goes along with China being the existential threat of, uh, of this century is their growing nuclear capability. And the remaining 10, 15 minutes, let's uh, bring in some audience question. Please introduce yourself quickly. Hello, my name is Sarkhan. I'm from Azerbaijan, Kamka Network member. Uh, since you have touched many countries in the region and the Kamka region, uh, my question is uh, US ally Azerbaijan. What should be the position of Azerbaijan in all this uh, current unstable situation in the region? So what would be uh, your, uh, I mean, the giving the perspective, what Azerbaijan is doing and what uh, Azerbaijan has to do? Yeah. Thanks. Well, uh, of course, you've, you've got the further problem of being next to Iran. And uh, uh, I think uh, really in, in the Middle East as a whole, it's Iran is the central threat to international peace and security. And their, their efforts to get nuclear weapons, which I don't think have slowed down at all, uh, their support for international terrorism really, really makes things very, very complicated. Uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia have, have a long history that's very complicated right now. I'm, I'm sure there are Armenians here in the room too. They I'm are. not, not going to rehearse that. that. That's a big issue. And, and the argument I would make to all three of the Caucasus states, which I visited after uh, one of my meetings with Putin, and I was uh, very happy to tell him where I was going after I left Moscow, too. I hope it made him happy. Uh, is that, the, look, the, these historical differences are real. I, I'm not, I'd be the last one to try and minimize them, but when you're in a neighborhood that dangerous, uh, to, have, uh, to have a chance of, of progress, uh, you have to think very carefully where your real priorities are, where the really big threat is, and where the, the issues that need outside help are. Is it really... Uh, in the case of Azerbaijan, is it really Armenia or is it Russia and Iran? I mean, it's uh, uh, f so for the folks from Mongolia who, who are here who, who, who say they like to say that they're, they're, they're a, a pearl between two shells. I mean, I, don't, I, I would say you've got three little pearls there between two shells, and you need to think about uh, how to arrange your relations. It's not something I think people from the outside can be terribly helpful with if the parties themselves can't negotiate. As I say, I don't minimize how difficult this is, I'm not taking sides, I'm just saying in the geopolitical reality you face, 
there are bigger threats on either side of you than right next to each other. Let's bring in more questions. Yes, please introduce can you, yourself quickly. Can you, can you hear me? Uh, so and, and, and in the interest of time, perhaps, because this is always what happens. At first, nobody wants to raise their hands, and then we have many more coming up. It's, it's an old game. So what we will do is, please be brief. We'll take three at a time, so we'll bring in as many voices as possible. Oh, I deeply appreciate it. Thank you so much. Arif Yaqoubi from Afghanistan International TV. Uh, Mr. Bolton, in your opinion, what is the alternative to the Taliban in Afghanistan? And my second part of the question is that, uh, what would be the consequences if the international community recognized Taliban as the legitimate government of that country? Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. Uh, let, let's bring in two, three more questions. Yeah. Oh, I see the microphone Hi. is already being moved. Go I ahead. The mic, yeah. Hi, Kadir from Uzbekistan. Do you think uh, a lack of uh, proactive uh, involvement of U.S. Uh, in the war of Russia in, in Georgia when the northern Ossetia in Abkhazia was, uh, was conquered and taken away from a sovereign country and also uh, aggressive, uh, well, let's say uh, the war in Iraq, where without the general uh, international um, uh, support or coalition, the war was started, kind of emboldened Putin in one way. He saw that, okay, U.S. doesn't really have the guts to interfere in the region. Uh, he saw it in Georgia, and on the other hand, uh, U.S. as being the uh, single superpower and leader of the free world can revive, review the, the borders of uh, sovereign countries, then we can do as well. And he uses this uh, uh, in his uh, speeches a lot. So do you think that emboldened him? And has there been some lessons learned here in the US? Uh, All right, thank you. Let, let me answer those yeah, before I forget, yeah, yeah, before there, I forget what go. I'm being asked about. There you go. Look, in, in Afghanistan, uh, uh, it's hard to imagine the situation can get worse than it is, especially for the people of Afghanistan. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, the United States should make every effort to persuade other countries not to recognize Taliban as the legitimate government. And I think we should help out the resistance, which, uh, at least according to reports I've seen, has sprung up uh, dependably in the Panjshir Valley and, and, and elsewhere. It's just we shouldn't accept that Taliban is a legitimate government because it's still a terrorist organization. That's not a terribly popular position in the United States these days. But ev even uh, the Biden administration has admitted that uh, at this point uh, uh, ISIS-K is capable of mounting a terrorist attack on the United States from uh, Afghan territory, and ISIS probably will be in fairly short order. This is it's just a, a terrible mistake that was made, and I think uh, we've got to start the long path of, uh, of, of trying to reverse it. And, uh, uh, it's not going to be easy, that's for sure. Look, I think uh, in 2008, when, when the Russians invaded Georgia, we were in the middle of a financial crisis. George Bush was five or six months away from leaving office. We didn't respond. But, uh, but I think, uh, if you'll recall, it was in the middle of a presidential campaign that candidate Barack Obama, as, as Russia is invading Georgia, Barack Obama called on both sides to exercise restraint. Both, both sides, what, are you kidding me? Uh, so I think, I think the Russians took his measure right there, and I think that uh, uh, that, that, has, that has had an effect on uh, what they then did later in Ukraine, and I think they read Biden the same way. Uh, I'm, I'm, I may be one of the few people out there who still believe that uh, overthrowing Saddam Hussein was the right thing to do, but I do believe that. I think we made mistakes later, but it was not, uh, uh, not the failure of American uh, military there that uh, was the problem. It was the, it was the failure to appreciate the complexities that followed. And, uh, you know, it is, it is a fact, we're, we're seeing it a little bit now in Ukraine, that uh, staying power uh, is a critical factor in any international decision. And if you don't prepare the public adequately, if you don't build support in advance, it's hard to sustain people's attention. That's something that Putin's counting on, too. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a failure of political leadership domestically, whether in the United States or elsewhere, not, not to explain to the people why they're being called upon to take actions in faraway countries. And uh, uh, you know, I think we could have saved the position in Afghanistan if people had only fully appreciated that while it was far from perfect, uh, the U.S. and other countries had not faced terrorist attacks since 9-11. I'm getting the signal that we are in the final five minutes. So uh, 
and, and I can see that the microphone is autonomously being moved around, so it's, <laughs> it seems clearly out of my control and hands here. So uh, we can probably get one or two questions, and I'm looking, in the, uh, I'm looking uh, back at my director. So, I'm sorry? Uh, I would very, the, it, it, would, it would make my life much easier if you let me assign instead of the microphone being passed around. But now that you have it already, I'm going to let you ask it. And then we have two ladies here in this section who will get to ask questions, and then we'll wrap it up. Thank you. My name is Bohadar. Uh, I'm from Uzbekistan. I'm in the executive team of an organization called IT Park Uzbekistan, which is an executive agency responsible for developing IT in Uzbekistan. Ever since the war has started, um, there was an influx of uh, large IT companies from Belarus and Russia to Uzbekistan for obvious reasons. And we launched a, pro a special program that helps uh, these companies to relocate their highly qualified specialists to Uzbekistan. And this has drawn even more attention. So far, under this program, we have been successful to bring in more than 2,000 highly qualified IT specialists to Uzbekistan. The ultimate goal, of course, is to get these specialists to bring the potential of our young people, uh, of our young IT specialists in Uzbekistan. However, I'm being a bit careful of uh, how the West might be looking at this. I was talking to His Excellency, uh, the ambassador of the United States to Uzbekistan, Mr. Rosenblum. He said, look, if this is happening, that means our sanctions are working. But at the same time, uh, you know, with, with these people working here and then sending their money back to their families, I'm still being a bit careful not to get a judging eye of our Western countries, uh, of our, our Western partners on this process. So hey, what hey, your to recommendations... Rush. Hey, to rush, but can right. we get to the question? Uh, what would your recommendations be on this? Uh, are there any things that we should be careful about? Well, the first thing I'd be careful about is that they're not Russian troll farms, that they're simply exporting from Russia into some other friendly country. And uh, so I think you want to vet them very carefully. But I do think there's been an exodus of uh, trained uh, uh, scientists and others from Russia. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think it's uh, definitely worth considering if, if they would stay. But, but I, I also think they made, there's a risk they're going to go back. I, I think this is uh, uh, it's something to be cautious about, I would right. say. Thank you. The final two questions, and then Gauhar in the end. Please okay. go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And for th I apologize for being aggressive, but I wanted to. <laughs> Not aggressive at all. <laughs> okay. Um, well, my name is Nona Mamulashvili. I am naturally the, the, the Kamka Fellow, the Rumsfeld Fellow, and I'm the member of the Parliament of Georgia from the opposition. Um, I'll have very quick questions, two questions. One is that we're seeing that uh, in a couple of days, Georgia, together with three other countries, will receive a response from the EU regarding the candidacy. And uh, Georgia remains a big question because we have seen that the EU has outlined a number of problems that Georgia has, including the oligarch that uh, needs to be sanctioned. So um, I wonder if there is the mood in the US to um, join in or uh, follow the same line as the Europeans have now. And second, uh, regard, because there are no Ukrainians in this, uh, in this team, um, the land lease has been uh, signed and approved, but there is the, it takes time to deliver, to deliver the long-range weapons. So Ukrainians are suffering, and we are still looking for the uh, timeline when they will be receiving. So um, I don't know when would be the, the first opportunity that uh, the Ukrainians will receive this, uh, these weapons, because every day uh, it's delayed, 100 people are dying. Yeah. Thank well, you the, so much. The, the delay is par partly because uh, they need to be trained in the use of the weapons, which are which are quite sophisticated. And I think it's not so much the physical delivery as the training. But but I agree, it's they, they need to get there quicker. In terms of joining the EU, I'll just tell you for this is a much longer discussion. I'm not a fan of the European Union for a lot of reasons. <laughs> it, it, if you want to join the EU, God, God bless you. But 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 <laughs> but but please don't let them undercut NATO. Mm -hmm. Uh, as a German, I would uh, protest, but I won't. Uh, uh, th this, will, this is a much longer discussion. We might have backstage, uh, Ambassador. Last question, Gauhar, go ahead. Um, my name is Gauhar Nurgaliv. I'm from Kazakhstan, currently uh, working in a, a government reform company in the UK. Um, thank you for an interesting interview, Ambassador. 
my question is, in, um, you mentioned about the lack of response, proper response to the Russian aggression back in 2008 and 2014. And what do you see now as a scenario for peace in Ukraine and how to end the conflict and the timeline that you envisage yeah. for that? I, I don't see a scenario for ending the conflict. I don't think Putin at this point um, can afford to stop the conflict in the near term. He, he the reputational damage to the Russian military has been extraordinary. I think he needs to find a place where he can say, uh, I've achieved my objectives. I, I don't think that'll be a true statement, but he has to find some place, some way he can say that uh, and pass the smile test. Uh, and we're not, we're not close to that yet. And Zelensky, I don't, I don't know what, the, what basis he negotiates on. I mean, I think uh, for him to say, I'm gonna give up more territory than we had already lost to the Russians before February the 24th, could threaten his government. Um, uh, but it also depends on what's going on in the battlefield. We, we know Russian casualties have been high. Uh, we don't know so much about Ukrainian casualties, but I'm afraid they're very bad as well. Uh, and uh, you know they, they could be on the verge of collapse. So, uh, so things will, it goes to the earlier question about when, when the uh, heavy weaponry will get to the Ukrainian military on the front lines that can make a difference. We're in a race against time now. But, but if you put all this together, uh, I think the most likely uh, outcome for X months, six months, is the struggle continues. And it's, it's a terrible human and uh, economic tragedy in Ukraine, but I don't, I, unless there's some some uh, unbelievable exogenous development that occurs, I just see this continuing to drag on, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Uh, quick fix here, uh, for, for sure. Right. Very hard to predict when and, uh, more importantly, how this war will end. Ambassador uh, Bolton, I think it goes without saying, and I think everybody would agree that throughout the previous 45 minutes, we've covered a lot of ground. We could have uh, used probably another 45 minutes and still would not have been done considering uh, the very tumultuous times uh, that we live in. Suffice to say, uh, very grateful uh, for your time, for your analysis, uh, and uh, delighted that you can join us uh, this morning. Ambassador, this is your applause. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.